triple action stance swing control ankle joint. Functional overview, fabrication, and clinical application. This educational module is an overview of the triple action ankle joint. Topics include the theory of operation, how the triple action fits into the Becker family of adjustable ankle components, and essential aspects of fabrication. The clinical application of the triple action will be presented in the context of a standard adjustment procedure. This procedure has been developed to simplify tuning and to help arrive more quickly at optimal component settings in the orthotic treatment of complex pathologic musculoskeletal conditions. Theory of Operation Becker Orthopedic manufactures an extensive line of orthotic ankle components. Among these is Becker's family of adjustable ankle joints, standard action, dorsiflexion assist, and double action ankle joints have been the standard of orthotic care in the orthotic treatment of hundreds of thousands of patients in the United States and around the world for more than half a century. In 2014, Becker added the triple action ankle joint to its family of orthotic ankle components. Though the triple action can be configured to perform the functions of all other types, each one of these ankle components has unique advantages for certain types of orthotic treatment. The simplest and smallest ankle joint in the Becker product line of adjustable ankle components is the standard action. This component is most suitable for treatment of structural deficits, like fractures, sprained ligaments, and arthritis. The stirrup head of the standard action may be ground to adjust its range of motion, depending on the needs of the patient. The dorsiflexion assist joint has a long spring in its posterior channel to provide dorsiflexion assist and a high active range of motion. This component is suitable for patients with drop foot resulting from isolated dorsiflexor weakness. The double action ankle joint can be configured with springs or pins in the anterior and posterior channels. This flexible component may be used to treat mild dorsiflexor and plantar flexor deficits, as well as quadriceps weakness. The double action can be used to assist, resist, or stop motion in either direction, and is compatible with Becker's line of orthotic stance control knee components for KAFO applications. The triple action was designed using high resistance springs to permit the fine tuning necessary to balance the support for patients with biomechanical deficits at both the ankle and knee. The springs are durable to keep up with the most active patients and minimize the number of follow-up visits. The independent resist and alignment features of the triple action help to simplify the orthotic treatment of complex neuromuscular disorders like stroke and traumatic brain injury. To help explain how the triple action works, we will compare its operation and basic functions to the more familiar double action ankle joint. The double action is a versatile design with many advantages. It is simple, reliable, and has the ability to be configured with either springs or pins in its anterior and posterior channels. This versatility makes the double action suitable for many orthotic applications. The double action ankle joint is best suited to the orthotic management of mild swing and stance phase gait deficits. These deficits may include dorsiflexor weakness and mild plantiflexor or quadriceps weakness as the result of upper or lower motor neuron pathologic conditions. This component may also be suitable for the management of mild spasticity as the result of stroke or other conditions. The double action is compatible with Becker's line of stance control knee components and suitable for the management of more severe knee flexion instability when used in KAFO designs. As its name implies, the double action has springs in its posterior and anterior channels. The compression on these springs is adjusted by turning the adjustment set screws. Adjusting the compression of either spring may change the compression of both springs as well as the stirrup alignment. The double action can be configured with springs or pins in either channel. With a spring in the posterior channel, the component provides dorsiflexion assist. With a pin in the posterior channel, the component provides a plantar flexion stop. 
a pin in the anterior channel will assertively stop dorsiflexion. This video illustrates how the stirrup moves inside the body of the double action ankle joint. Note that as the stirrup rotates, the springs maintain contact with the stirrup head throughout the entire range of motion. Both springs influence the stirrup during plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. Because the springs maintain contact with the stirrup head throughout its entire range of motion, the springs may work against one another, delivering less resistance for some adjustment settings. In addition, adjusting the resist settings may also change the ankle alignment. This is why the double actions resist and alignment adjustments are interdependent. Like the double action, the triple action has anterior and posterior spring channels which provide dorsiflexion and plantar flexion resistance. Unlike the double action, however, the triple action has two anterior channels to provide a higher level of dorsiflexion resistance. The middle dorsiflexion resist spring is not adjustable, but provides two important functions. This spring allows the triple action to be adjusted to slow the tibia through the second rocker while providing a higher, active level of resistance at the end of stance phase to help stabilize the knee. This slide illustrates that the triple action springs do not maintain contact with the stirrup head through its entire range of motion. When the stirrup is in plantar flexion, only the plantar flexion resist spring contacts the stirrup. As the stirrup dorsiflexes, the stirrup head breaks contact with the plantar flexion resist spring and makes contact with the dorsiflexion resist springs. For some dorsiflexion resist settings, the stirrup contacts the middle spring first to provide a moderate level of resistance before contacting the high resistance dorsiflexion resist spring in the anterior most channel. As shown in the image on the right, both the middle and anterior springs resist with the stirrup head in this position to provide a high level of dorsiflexion resistance. This design isolates the plantar flexion resist, dorsiflexion resist, and alignment features, making them independently adjustable. Because changes to the resist settings do not affect stirrup alignment, an independent alignment feature was added. This alignment adjustment changes the angle between the upper bar and the stirrup when the adjustment cam is rotated. The joint body rotates around the pivot bushing during this adjustment. The triple action ankle joint offers many advantages in the orthotic treatment of pathologic neuromuscular conditions. The isolation between adjustments for plantar flexion, dorsiflexion resist, and alignment simplifies tuning for complex patients with combined ankle and knee instabilities or spasticity. The triple action uses high resistance springs to help with the fine tuning necessary to balance the support for the ankle and knee simultaneously. And the springs last hundreds of thousands or even millions of strides to decrease patient appointments, saving clinicians time in the exam room. The independent adjustment of triple action features helps the clinicians see the effect of component adjustments while tuning. Becker's step-by-step -step adjustment procedure was developed through biomechanical studies and helps the clinician arrive more quickly near optimal settings. The procedure is similar to prosthetic alignment and involves the following four steps. Bench adjustment, static alignment, swing phase adjustment, and stance phase adjustment. The procedure will be described in detail later in this presentation. As stated previously, the triple action is ideally suited to the orthotic treatment of patients with complex, combined, and or changing neuromuscular deficits. Indications for use include lower extremity gait deficits as a result of stroke, traumatic brain injury, or other upper motor neuron pathology. 
Contraindications include profound knee or hip weakness or geno recurvatum greater than 10 degrees. To summarize, while the triple action overlaps with some features of the double action ankle joint, each component is designed with unique advantages for their respective applications. The double action is a simple design, highly configurable and suitable for patients with mild dorsiflexor and or quadriceps weakness, low tone, or limited ankle range of motion. The double action is also compatible with stance control components in a KFO design when a pin is used in the anterior channel. The triple action ankle joint was designed for the treatment of complex neuromuscular conditions through all stages of rehabilitation. It has independent adjustment features that facilitate a procedure that simplifies and speeds up tuning. The springs provide higher resistance to help balance adjustments for ankle and knee stability with increased durability to keep up with active patients and reduce follow-up visits. Each of these ankle joints is best suited to different applications. Together, they offer a broad range of care options for your most challenging patients. Orthotic Design Product documentation for the Triple Action includes the Triple Action Data Sheet, Quick Start Guide, Clinical Guide, and Fabrication Guide. These documents are included with the component and are also available through Becker's website at www.beckerorthopedic.com. Also included with the component are the High Resistance Spring, pin, and set screw option for the plantar flexion resist channel. Two lengths of metric bar attachment screws are included, as well as Teflon grease and thread locking adhesive. There are three different stirrup options available for the triple action ankle joint. The swept stirrup for plastic AFOs, a Y stirrup for composite AFOs, and a split stirrup caliper plate option for conventional AFO designs. When necessary, the triple action can also be paired with a free motion camber axis technic companion joint to reduce the overall weight of the orthosis. The triple action is available as a left, right, or pair. As with other Becker components, left is defined as a left lateral or right medial component. For best results, triple action AFO designs should be rigid, made of polypropylene or composite. Becker recommends using two triple action components with polypropylene AFOs. Two components are also recommended for patients weighing greater than 90 kilograms or high neuromuscular tone. For smaller patients or those with less tone, the triple action can be paired with a medial companion joint, like the camber axis, to reduce the overall weight of the orthosis. Fabrication A fabrication kit, model 3A00-FTK, is available for the triple action that includes component dummies and an alignment rod to help accurately locate the bars during fabrication. The alignment bushings used to hold the bar and stir up to the fabrication dummy are disposable. A reference tube, also included in the fabrication kit, is used to provide a visual reference when aligning the ankle axis with the negative mold. Once the alignment rod is set in the negative mold, the mold is filled in typical fashion with plaster to create the anatomical model. The triple action upper bar and stirrup should be removed from the component body and attached to the component dummy during fabrication. This exploded view shows the parts of the triple action. The flat wire clip on the top of the stirrup head is the noise damper. This damper is captured in the clevis by the stirrup head 
and reduces the noise made by the make and break contact between the springs and the stirrup head when the patient is walking. The pivot bushing is lightly pressed into the upper bar. It holds the upper bar and stirrup to the component body. The stirrup and upper bar both rotate on the pivot bushing. The upper bar alignment is changed by the adjustment cam. The adjustment is locked by a clamp formed by the slit in the component body and the cam lock nut. The alignment nut also locks the dorsiflexion resist adjustment. The cam fits into a slot in the upper bar. There is a U-shaped clip called the cam clip also in the slot. This clip reduces the play in the alignment adjustment. The upper bar is held to the cam bushing by the cam screw. This video illustrates how to disassemble the triple action ankle joint. First loosen, but do not remove, all three of the adjustment screws. Note that the alignment lock nut must be loosened one quarter turn to release the dorsiflexion resist adjustment screw. Retighten the alignment lock nut one quarter turn. Remove the cam screw and cam clip from the upper bar. Slightly loosen the pivot screw from the pivot bushing and use the screw to help push the bushing out of the component body. Next, remove the stirrup from the clevis. Remove the damper from the stirrup head and the cam clip from the upper bar and set them aside. The pivot bushing is lightly pressed into the upper bar. Use the pivot screw to help gently push the pivot bushing out of the upper bar. This completes the disassembly procedure. The stirrup and upper bar are attached to and aligned by the component dummy during fabrication. There is a pin in the component dummy that fits into the small holes in the stirrup head and upper bar to align them. Assemble the fabrication tool as illustrated in the following video. To assemble the fabrication tool, first push one of the plastic alignment bushings included in the fabrication kit through the pivot hole in the upper bar from the contoured side. The shoulder of the bushing should be on the side of the bar closest to the mold. Next align the upper bar with the dummy using the bushing and the small pin in the dummy. Complete assembly of the fabrication tool by pushing the bushing through the hole in the dummy and then through the pivot hole in the stirrup head.
When contouring the upper bar and stirrup, use care not to bend or mar where they attach to the component body. Doing so may impede the stirrup and alignment adjustment from articulating freely. Remember to also add three millimeters or one eighth of an inch to the clearance between the upper bar and the mold to allow for the protrusion of the pivot bushing head. After the orthosis has been fabricated, use the fabrication template, which is included in the fabrication kit, to establish the trim lines for the component. The trim line for the tibial section is 50 millimeters proximal to the pivot hole. The trim line for the foot plate section is 30 millimeters distal to the pivot hole. This video illustrates how to reassemble the joint after fabrication. First, gently press or tap the pivot bushing back into the upper bar using your fingers or a plastic mallet. The shoulder of the bushing should be on the contoured side of the bar, closest to the mold. Insert the cam clip into the slot in the upper bar with its open end toward the pivot bushing. Use the flat side of a screwdriver to help install the clip if necessary. Next, apply Teflon grease to the pivot bushing, the stirrup head, and the damper. Correctly orient the damper on the stirrup head and insert the stirrup and damper into the clevis in the component body. Note that the damper is not symmetrical and should be oriented with its longer side toward the anterior of the component body. Reassemble the component body with the upper bar and stirrup. Apply a drop of thread locking adhesive to the cam screw and the pivot screw. Use the cam screw to gently draw the cam clip into the slot in the upper bar. Install and tighten the pivot screw. Lastly, tighten the middle set screw. This set screw is not adjustable and should remain fully tightened except during fabrication or maintenance. This slide shows the orientation of the cam clip and the damper for correct installation. This slide illustrates where to apply thread locking adhesive to the cam screw and pivot screw. The plantar flexion and dorsiflexion resist adjustment screws are pre-coated with an anti-vibration coating and do not require thread locking adhesive for the first five adjustments. If more than five adjustments are made to the resist settings, however, apply thread locking adhesive to the adjustment screws to prevent migration. After the components have been reassembled, attach them to the orthosis using the provided metric attachment screws. Apply a drop of thread locking adhesive to each of the attachment screws prior to assembly. Making adjustments. A 4mm ball end Allen wrench and 10mm open end wrench are necessary for adjustment of the triple action ankle joint. These tools are included in the triple action adjustment kit. Model 3A00-ATK. 
As mentioned previously, there are three independent adjustment features on the triple action. Planter flexion resistance, dorsiflexion resistance, and ankle alignment. This video illustrates how to adjust ankle alignment. Prior to changing the alignment setting, the adjustment cam is unlocked by loosening the alignment lock nut one quarter turn. The tibial section of the orthosis will move in the same direction as the adjustment cam during the alignment adjustment. Lock the adjustment by tightening the alignment lock nut one quarter turn. The alignment angle is read in degrees from the scale on the top of the component body. The adjustment range is plus or minus 10 degrees. It is important to note that the zero degree mark on the scale represents the fabrication angle of the AFO, not necessarily the neutral angle of the orthosis. The plantar flexion resistance is adjusted by simply turning the adjustment screw. Rotate the plantar flexion resistance adjustment screw counterclockwise to decrease the resistance and clockwise to increase the resistance. When making adjustments to the plantar flexion resist setting, begin by turning the adjustment screw fully clockwise to lock the setting. As the plantar flexion resistance is decreased by turning the adjustment screw counterclockwise, Keep track of the setting by counting the number of half turns away from the locked position. Changes to the plantar flexion resist setting alter the preload resistance and the range of motion and plantar flexion by 5 degrees per turn of the adjustment screw. The maximum setting is 3 turns away from locked or 15 degrees of active plantar flexion for the standard plantar flexion resist spring. The dorsiflexion resistance is adjusted by turning the adjustment screw. Prior to this adjustment, however, the setting must be unlocked by loosening the alignment lock nut one quarter turn. Rotate the dorsiflexion resistance adjustment screw counterclockwise to decrease the resistance and clockwise to increase the resistance. When making adjustments to the dorsiflexion resist setting, begin by turning the adjustment screw fully clockwise to lock the setting. As the dorsiflexion resistance is decreased by turning the adjustment screw counterclockwise, keep track of the setting by counting the number of half turns away from the locked position. Changes to the dorsiflexion resist setting alter the preload resistance and the range of motion and dorsiflexion by 3 degrees per turn of the adjustment screw. The maximum setting is 4 turns away from locked or 12 degrees of active dorsiflexion. To summarize, the triple action is a high resistance, durable ankle component with independent plantar flexion resist, dorsiflexion resist, and alignment adjustments. The plantar flexion resistance offers both standard and high resistance spring options, depending upon the weight and neuromuscular tone of the patient. There are two dorsiflexion resist springs that provide high resistance to dorsiflexion. The adjustment range of preload resistance and the change in range of motion per turn of the adjustment screws differs slightly between the plantar flexion and dorsiflexion resist functions. The triple action optimization procedure. Becker Orthopedic, through biomechanical research, has developed a step-by-step -step optimization procedure for the triple action ankle joint. This procedure is intended to help the clinician tune the component to their patient's unique supportive needs. 
This approach to tuning is similar to methods that have been used to adjust prostheses for many years, with the added complexity of an intact, spastic limb in parallel with a mechanical component. There are four steps to the procedure. Bench adjustment, static alignment, swing phase adjustment, and stance phase adjustment. Observational gait analysis is used to perform each of these steps. Explicit events through the gait cycle are defined and correspond to specific component adjustments. Bench adjustment. Prior to bench adjustment, select which plantar flexion resist spring is most appropriate for the patient, standard resist or high resist. The standard plantar flexion resist spring comes factory installed. If the patient's weight is greater than 90 kilograms or 180 pounds, has high tone, or if the orthosis was fabricated with only one triple action, install the high resistance spring. The high resist spring provides more resistance to plantar flexion than the standard spring, but with less active range of motion. This slide illustrates the procedure for installing the high resistance plantar flexion resist spring. Grease the pin, push the greased pin into the spring, Wipe excess grease off the outside of the spring. Insert the pin, spring, and set screw into the posterior channel of the component body. Perform the bench adjustment as follows. Lock the plantar flexion resist. Lock the dorsiflexion resist and set the alignment to zero degrees. Static alignment is performed with the patient standing. During this step, the plantar flexion and dorsiflexion resistances will remain locked. With the patient in quiet standing, adjust the alignment setting to incline the shank and improve the patient's sense of balance and comfort. During adjustment, try to balance the weight line over the midfoot to have equal pressure on the heel and the toe. The patient should not feel as if they are being pushed forward or backward. The knee may flex or extend during this procedure. Typical inclination of the tibial crest is about 11 degrees but this should serve as a reference only. Some patients may not have enough range of motion due to gastrosoleus shortening to incline the shank during this adjustment. Alternatively, a heel lift may be placed between the orthosis and the shoe insole to help incline the shank without increasing the dorsiflexion of the orthosis. Swing phase adjustment is done with the patient walking. The goal of this step of the optimization procedure is to improve toe clearance and foot position at initial contact. Swing phase adjustment is done with the patient walking. During the swing phase adjustment, the resistance settings will remain locked. Alignment is adjusted while focusing on two specific gait events, toe clearance at mid-swing and foot-to-floor angle at initial contact. For reference, the typical foot-to-floor angle is 25 degrees for normal gait. When adjusting for foot position at initial contact, attempt to improve symmetry with the patient's other limb. To increase either the toe clearance or the foot to floor angle, adjust the alignment towards dorsiflexion. To decrease the toe clearance or foot to floor angle, adjust the alignment toward plantar flexion. It is also useful to observe step length symmetry when making this adjustment. 
Note that a shortened or hypertonic gastrocnemius may reduce the effectiveness of the swing phase adjustment. If this occurs, increased dorsiflexion alignment may actually decrease the foot-to-floor angle due to reduced knee extension at initial contact. Early stance phase adjustment is done with the patient walking. The goal of this adjustment is to optimize both ankle and knee stability through the first rocker and early stance phase of the gait cycle. This step of the adjustment procedure focuses on early stance phase and involves primarily the plantar flexion resist setting. With the patient walking, observe knee flexion from initial contact to loading response. If there is excessive knee flexion, decrease the plantar flexion resistance to soften knee flexion. Count the number of turns of the adjustment screw to keep track of the setting during this adjustment. If foot slap occurs or knee hyperextension increases in early stance, increase the plantar flexion resistance. Late stance phase adjustment is done with the patient walking. The goal of this adjustment is to optimize knee stability in late stance while maximizing energy return at terminal stance. With the patient walking, observe the ankle and knee in late stance. If there is early heel rise or excessive knee extension, decrease the dorsiflexion resistance. If there is excessive knee flexion in late stance, increase the dorsiflexion resistance. Adjusting the dorsiflexion resistance may have less impact if the patient has limited dorsiflexion range of motion or if they tend to hyperextend throughout stance phase for stability. Following initial optimization, it may be necessary to finely tune the adjustment settings using patient feedback. Observing the patient's gross trunk motion may also provide insight into the patient's sense of balance and stability. This completes the optimization procedure. This and the following slide are included as a comprehensive summary for clinical reference. This concludes this program, the Triple Action Stance Swing Control Ankle Joint Functional Overview, Fabrication, and Clinical Application. For additional information regarding the Triple Action Ankle Joint, please visit our website at www.beckerorthopedic.com or contact our Customer Service Department at one 800 521 2192. Continuing education credits are available for this and other triple action programs through the American Board for Certification in Orthotics and Prosthetics. To qualify, visit our website and complete the triple action ankle joint overview, fabrication, and clinical application quiz.